We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12, and we're only going to be covering the first three verses of this chapter. And I've titled today's message, The Christian Marathon. The Christian Marathon. Now, um, ever since chapter 10, verse 32, the author of this letter has been exhorting his readers, whether they're, they're his original readers or whether it's just as, as us just listening, reading this letter, to persevere in difficult circumstances and during the trials of life. And then in chapter 11, he provided some amazing, beautiful, wonderful examples, Old Testament examples, that we can look to and, and emulate. These were faithful men and women who, despite their weaknesses, despite their backgrounds, they trusted in God. They trusted in God's word in the hardest and most confusing moments of life. And God honored them by including them, by mentioning them here in the 11th, cha in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. Well, now, as we begin chapter 12 in our text this morning, the writer returns back to the theme of endurance and gets into detail about it. So what today's message will show you is that in order to run the Christian marathon with endurance, it's vital. It's absolutely vital that we, that, to have faith. A faith that focuses on Jesus, who endured the cross and received his reward or the reward. And so as I normally do, we're going to open up and, and we're going to pray and ask the Lord to speak to us through his word. I'm going to be reading and then I'll be breaking down what I just, what we just read. So let's pray and then we'll get into these three verses of Hebrews chapter 12. Heavenly Father, um, thank you. Thank you for being so faithful to us, Lord, even when we're lacking in faith, even when we're faithless, Lord, that you remain faithful, even when we're doubting, Lord, even when we're doubting your promises, your word, that you still remain faithful and that you keep your promises. Lord, we know that it's, it's not you, Lord, that is the problem, it's us. And sometimes we just we forget that you have been there, always have been there, that we're breathing, that we're alive, that, you know, we forget about all the blessings that we have because it's all because of you, because of your mercy and goodness and grace. And Lord, we, so now we acknowledge that. We thank you for those things, Lord. And we're, we also apologize and, and we, you know, just being, when we are faithless. Lord, I, I ask right now that you will speak to us powerfully through your word. Lord, as we open it up and read it, and we know your, your word has the power to change lives, to change marriages, change relationships. Lord, and, and that's what we want you to do now. And you also speak powerfully through the message that will come forth from your word, Lord. This, this message that you helped me to prepare. So show us, Lord. Show us the importance of endurance and, you know, just uh, how important it is to run that Christian marathon. So again, wash over this place, protect us, keep us safe, Lord. Lord, may we just be blessed right now by, as we sit at your feet and hear your word. Pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 12.
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. The Word of God says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. Now, as I was studying this, I was going through this chapter and deciding how much of it I was going to be covering. One of the things I noticed is that in the first half of this chapter, and as we go through it next week and in the next upcoming weeks, the author will continue to exhort his readers to persevere by assigning several reasons to endure. And in the passage we just read in these three verses is his first reason. We see his first reason. Before telling you what that is and explaining it, getting right into it, he wants us to keep those examples that he just mentioned in chapter 11. He wants us to keep them fresh in our mind, right in the forefront of our minds by, again, using the word, therefore. Now, he, he says, therefore, because he anticipates that his readers would be like, okay, so we, we understand what you're saying. These were great, faithful men. They did a lot of great things, and, and you know, wow, they're great, they are great examples. But really, what's, why are you telling us this? Why, what's the point? And basically, he tells us that those men and women endured They endured in the hardest of times. And if they endured in the hardest of times, in the trials of life, then we too must also endure in faith in our hardest moments. Now, in order to help us understand what that endurance means, he likens living the Christian life to running a race because of how similar they are. You see, in both, in both endeavors, there's a start and a finish. Both require effort. Both require training. Both have been marked by a path that has been laid by others. Both require discipline. And each has a reward at the end, but unlike an actual physical marathon or foot race, the Christian life is a moral race that requires a completely different kind of endurance. Now, believe it or not, it may not look like it, but before I planted this church, I ran a lot. There were times I would run from the North Hills, you know, all the way towards Chapin, And run back. There were times I would run through the hills, these streets, and and at first it began by just walking from one block to the other. And I was like, well, okay, maybe I can run this block and I can run the next. And eventually that endurance was built up and I was able to run more and more and more. And and although I never ran a full-on marathon, I did run a half marathon. And man, that it was challenging. And, but I knew that I, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do it in the beginning. I had, I had to build my endurance. I had to run and I had to continue running and, and I enjoyed it. I loved it. When I planted this church, it took up, you know, it took up the, the majority of my time and energy. Um, and, you know, as you can see now, I, I don't run and, you know, as much as I used to, but I do miss it. And maybe one day I'll be able to get back into it. 
and then I'll be looking differently, you know, maybe a lot more, you know, I don't know, different. But, um, but it is, the Christian life, it's similar, but it's a different kind of endurance. First of all, the Christian life is a difficult marathon that we must run. If you are a born-again believer, if you have asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, it's a marathon that you must run. It's a lifelong, grueling race that entails some of the long hills to climb and some really swampy marshes to plod through. To make it to the end, you need self-discipline to get into good shape. You will need to maintain your motivation and you will need sustained effort. No one enters into a marathon with the thought of dropping out after the first mile. Finishing well is the goal. Finishing well is everything. In this race, though, you're not competing with other believers. We're all on the same team. We're competing against the enemy of our souls who opposes God's kingdom and just wants to see us drop out, wants to see us disqualify ourselves. Secondly, to run this Christian marathon, we must get in shape and stay in shape. Now, the primary thing, as I said, is self-discipline motivated by the goal of finishing well. But it specifically involves two things. And we're told here that we must lay aside every hindrance, first of all. The word hindrance means weight. It can refer to physical weight, obesity, or to unnecessary baggage. Ancient Greek runners would actually run naked so as to not be encumbered. Olympic athletes in our day wear some pretty skimpy outfits, as you might have seen before. They don't want anything, anything to slow them down or to drain their energy. Now, picture the Boston Marathon or even the El Paso Marathon here. The lean, muscular Kenyan runners are in front of the pack waiting for the starting gun. A couple of skinny American runners are there too, even Mexican runners. You've seen those skinny Mexican runners, I've seen them. But right next to them, is a fat, flubby guy, someone like me again, wearing a parka, all weather pants, hiking boots, with a 50 pound, 50 pound pack. You ask curiously, what's in your pack? And he says, I've got all the sodas and Twinkies that I need to finish this race. And you're thinking, right. That guy wouldn't stand a chance of finishing, let alone winning. He hasn't laid aside every hindrance. hindrance my, hindrances, my friends, are distinguished here from sins. They include the things that are not intrinsically wrong, but they're wrong because they keep you from running as you should. If you got rid of those heavy hiking boots and put on some jogging shoes, you know that you'd run better. If you dropped a pack and dressed in shorts and a tank top, you might finish the race. At the risk of stepping on some toes, but to help you to apply this, let me be just a little bit more specific. Let's say that in the morning, you just don't have time to read your Bible and or your favorite phone app or your, you know, whatever news paper or news you, you normally get your headlines from. And as you head, before you head out the door, you just didn't have time to do that. 
before you head out the door to work or to school. But which do you choose, you think to yourself, you protest. But I need to keep abreast. I have to know what's going on, what's happening in the world. Really? Where does the Bible say that? It does say in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, that you need to drink in the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. And so maybe you don't have time to read anything because you don't set your alarm early enough to spend just 10 minutes with the Lord. You see what I'm, do you see what I'm saying? You need to get rid of hindrances of long sleep, of loving sleep, or even the paper, even that app. And, you know, so that you can spend more time with the Lord. Those things that are hindering you from getting closer to God and knowing Him more, knowing Him more intimately. If you want really to know who God is, and I think there's a lot of people out there who, like, I want to know. I want to know God more. Put away that phone. Put away that, yeah, you can look up your Bible on your phone. I know there's, and on your tablet. But if you find yourself easily, you know, clicking out of the Bible app and going into TikTok or, you know, Instagram or Snapchat and YouTube, whatever it may be, those are hindrances. Those are the things that are keeping you from drawing near from the Lord, from the Lord actually wanting to speak to you personally. Some of you, some of you are really hungry for that. But some of those things are, are keeping you. So get rid of those hindrances. Too much recreation can be another hindrance in the, in the race. We all, yes, we all need some free time to be renewed. But the question is, how much time do you really need? Many Christians fill every evening watching TV, or they spend every, when they get out of work, they spend their, most of their time on their computer but they don't have time to study the Bible or read really good books. They view the entire weekend as just a time of recreation, even if it means missing church. And so to run the race, you've got to lay aside these hindrances. Now, some Christians ask the wrong question here. They ask, what's wrong with this movie or listening to this music? or participating in this activity, the right question is, does this help me grow in godliness? In godliness? If not, my friends, if not Christian, then cast it aside as dead weight. Cast it off as dead weight. Oh, another aspect of finishing strong Yes, involves laying aside also every sin that so easily ensnares us. In biblical times, people wore long robes. You can't run with a long robe entangling your legs. You must either pull it up and tuck it in your belt or cast it totally aside. In the case of sin, you must totally shed it off. You must get rid of it. If you want to run the Christian race. And now this doesn't refer to only certain besetting sins, but to all sins. Not tiny sins, but all sins. See, sin always begins in the mind. And so we must judge all sin at the thought level. Is it a sin? Is, is it a sin to you? Do you consider what you're doing? sinful there's a lot of christians out there who say you know you know drinking isn't a sin and you know it talks about it in the bible but i was having this conversation with someone this week and uh, you know and i i, th I think also isaac sent a uh you know an article but drinking is sinful when it's causing you to sin when it's causing 
you problems at home, at work, when that becomes more important to you, when it's causing you, it's hindering your thought process, and you're no no longer making good, right decisions, but you're making some really dumb ones. So these things that are causing you to sin, get rid of them. If you, even if it means eating something, and if for you it's a sin, if you feel convicted by it, don't eat it. Pride, lust, envy, greed, anger, grumbling, selfishness, all these things originate in our thought life. If you cut it off there, it doesn't go any further. If you entertain these things, They incubate. They incubate and develop into sinful words and actions. And you can read James chapter 1, verses 14 and 50, and it says, that's what it says. But the author's point is you can't run the Christian race if you keep tripping over your sins. What kind of runner will you be? You just keep tripping over them. Thirdly, to run the Christian marathon, we must run with endurance the course that lies before us. Now with that there, just the, that, that, those words there, that phrase there, I want you to note two things that are important here. First of all, God sets the course. He's the one who sets the course. If you're running a marathon, You can't make up your own course. If you stray from the course, you will be disqualified. The the race is already set before us. Just as Jesus had the joy set before him. Friends, God is the sovereign one who sets the course for each of us. Just as he set the course of the cross for Jesus. So to finish the Christian marathon, it's important to keep in mind at all times that the sovereign God sets the course. You may not like parts of the course. You may be prone to grumble. Why did the course have to go over this hill or through this swamp? Why does it have to be these dogs yapping at me? Or why does it have to be 100 degrees outside? Or... But the answer is this. Because the sovereign God planned it this way. He planned it that way. You won't be able to run by faith unless you submit your will to his will. Forth, we must run with endurance. Running with endurance requires adopting a certain mindset. If you have a mind that running a 400 meter race, you're not going to do well when the pack keeps going on after 400 meters. When you learn that the race has barely begun, you're going to quit with a bad attitude. This is what Jesus meant when he he talked about counting the cost of following him in Luke chapter 14. Before you make just a a commitment, before you make just a, a, a real commitment to be a Christian, really think it through. Do you know, really know the cost of being a Christian? Are you willing to put the effort, put out the effort, the sweat, the endurance, and the pain of going the distance? Are you willing to push yourself even when everybody else, even when you want the enemy, everything else or everything around you is wanting you to quit? 
Will you continue to go the distance in order to finish the race? If not, then don't start the race. Don't start the race because you're going to look pretty silly when you drop out just after 400 meters. Now, obviously, one key to running the whole distance is motivation. But where, where do you get the motivation to run? Now, our author here suggests two sources where you can get that motivation, both valuable, but the second is incomparably greater than the first. You see, the encouragement to keep running comes from those who have run before us, but primarily from Jesus Christ himself. The first source is the great cloud of witnesses that encourages us to keep running. The opening phrase of verse 1 refers back to chapter 11. All the Old Testament saints who endured all sorts of trials by faith should encourage us, encourage you to keep running when you feel like quitting. The word cloud was a classical Greek metaphor for a large multitude. Now, there's a question about whether these witnesses are watching us from heaven as we run the race, or more in line with the meaning of the word witness, do we look to their testimony as an example of how to run the race? Now, there's no indication in the Bible, unless it's here, that those in heaven are watching us on earth. Probably with the race metaphor, the picture here is that as we run the race along the route, we encounter the Old Testament saints and by extension, other heroes of, of the faith in the New Testament, plus those who lived after those, these biblical times. They're calling out to us. They're calling out to you by their examples of faith. Keep going. Keep going. I made it, and you can too. I know. I know that it's hard. I've been there. I know how hard it is. But the reward, the reward is worth it. Don't quit. The finish line isn't too far ahead. That's how they're encouraging you. I would. I would also encourage you to study both the many interesting characters in the Bible and the great men and women who have run the race of faith over the course of church history. You'll learn how they failed so that you won't have to make the same mistakes. And you'll also learn how they ran well, so you can imitate their faith. Many of the battles they fought, whether on a, on a personal level or in their ministries, you will have to fight as well. Knowing that the godly pastor Knowing that, that a godly pastor like Jonathan Edwards got voted out of his church and understanding the reasons why can be a great source of encouragement to a pastor who is battling in a very difficult church ministry. Realizing all the problems that Hudson Taylor's China Inland Mission went through can help you to hang in there when problems continue to multiply when they continue to that stack gets higher that mountain gets higher and higher i sometimes think about the disappointments the suffering and persecution from adenarium judson a missionary what he endured in burma and think i can endure a few hardships in ministry, but nothing like that. But the best part, the best help in the race of faith doesn't come from 
this cloud of witnesses. You see, the, it's the other source. The other source is Jesus himself. He is the main motivation to keep running. The main way to run with endurance, the race that is laid before us, is, let me, let me read that again. Verse 2 and 3. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. The pronoun there, our, isn't in the original uh, before faith, as in some versions that, or some translations you may have, like the new, excuse me, the NIV or the New King James, or the King James Version. The Greek text has the definitive, definitive article, the faith, meaning the faith that is needed to endure. Jesus is the author. In our translation here, it says pioneer. In many other translations, it says author. But also, in, in some, it says captain. Of that kind of faith. He is the pioneer, the author, the captain of that kind of faith. And he brings it to completion or perfection. He is the A to Z, the complete encyclopedia of faith, the complete Wikipedia of faith. The name Jesus deliberately focuses, the, when, it's, when his name is brought up here, it deliberately focuses on his humanity. As a man, Jesus showed us exactly how to live by faith in God in this world. He trusted God at the beginning of this ministry when Satan tempted him. He relied on God to such a degree that he could claim the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. He claimed to speak the very words that he heard from the father. He trusted the father in the garden and went to the cross entrusting his soul to the father. His final words included, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So you see, from start to finish, but especially on the cross, Jesus showed us how to walk by faith. Now, this, uh, this in our text here, what, what we see here is, it also reveals a few more things about Jesus. First, again, Jesus is the author, pioneer, captain of faith. We encountered this word back in the second chapter of Hebrews in verse 10, which stated that God perfected, uh, God perfected the author or the captain, the pioneer of our salvation through sufferings. It's also used in Acts chapter 3, verse 15, you put to death the prince of life. And Acts chapter 5, verse 31, to whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and savior. It can mean author or originator in a sense that Jesus is the source of life, salvation, and faith. It also refers to the leader, the pioneer or captain, the one who goes before the troops, showing them the way. All of these senses of the word apply to Jesus with regard to our faith. No sinner is capable of believing in Christ for salvation unless he grants it. It has to come from the Lord. And that person has to be willing to accept it. He says here, here's the gift of salvation. It's up to you 
whether you want to take it or not. You can believe in Jesus in the sense that you can say, yeah, he's a good prophet, he's a good teacher, he's a good moral person, but really believe in him. That, you know, and to be saved, he grants that salvation. He does the work. He does, he's the one that saves. But also, he blazes the trail of faith for all who follow him. He goes before us showing us how to live by faith in God alone. Second, Jesus is the perfecter of faith. This means that he finished the course of faith perfectly. He didn't veer off course. He didn't mess up one single time. He finished the course. He finished the race perfectly, showing us how to do it. But also, he brings our faith to completion. As Paul states in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, where he says, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Let me read that verse again. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Number three, Jesus shows us the motivation to endure by faith. As verse two again says, the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. The reason Jesus could endure the horrible prospect of bearing our sin was that he focused on the joy that was set before him. This joy including, included the joy of bringing many sons to glory. The joy of one day seeing you come to salvation. Of one day him seeing you in his kingdom and him wrapping his arms around you. Saying, I know how hard it was. And I'm so proud of you and so happy and so glad that you're here with me. But also, the greatest joy was that of glorifying the Father by completing the work that the Father gave him to do. When Jesus returned to heaven, triumphant over Satan, sin, death, and hell, the angels rejoiced. The marriage supper of the Lamb will be a time for us to rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. Keeping that glorious joy in view enabled Jesus to endure the agony of the cross. And before Jesus shows us the greatest example of endurance by faith through the most difficult trial ever. Some of you are maybe going through some really hard times, some really tough trials, maybe some persecution. But you know what? Jesus showed you, is showing you how to get through that. He endured the cross, despising the shame. He endured such hostility by sinners against himself. Friends, church, no one, no one at all has ever endured a greater trial than the cross. Others, yes, others have been crucified and others have been tortured in indescribable and horrible ways. But only Jesus, only our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ knew the glory and joy of perfect fellowship with the Father in heaven before coming to this earth. Only Jesus knew the perfect holiness of his divine nature to leave heaven and to take on the form of a servant, to take on the form of a human baby and then to be obedient to his death on the cross as a substitute for your sin, my sin, it's unmatched. 
in human history. Number five, Jesus shows us the final reward of faith. Again, there in our verse, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is in the most exalted place in the universe, the place of all rule and authority. The holy angels bow down before him in adoration and reverence. So while Jesus is unique, his exaltation to the right hand of the throne of God shows us a glimpse of his glory that we will share throughout eternity. If, if we run this race with endurance. Oh, again, verse 2. We're in this Christian life. We run. In this Christian life, we run with endurance by keeping our eyes on Jesus. You hear me say that all the time, many of you the importance of keeping your eyes on the cross, keeping your eyes on Jesus, not on what's going on around you, your circumstances, your trials, your, you know, just, you know, just those horrible things that you're struggling with. Keeping your eyes on Jesus. Now, I'll try to quickly go through these, but I want you to note four things. Keeping your eyes on Jesus requires you to take your eyes off yourself. Keeping your eyes is literally looking, means looking off too. The idea is taking off your eyes off other things and focusing on Jesus alone. The Bible tells us to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. And so we must examine ourselves before We partake in communion, which we'll be doing here in just a bit. We have to examine ourselves. We have to examine our hearts and see where we're at before we partake in the Lord's Supper. But we shouldn't live with our focus constantly on ourselves, but rather on the Lord. In your daily quiet time, it's good to pause and examine your heart. Is there any sin that you need to confess Is there any bad attitude or lack of faithfulness? But then, turn your eyes towards Jesus and all that you are in Him. Fixing our eyes on Jesus requires trusting all that He is for us. Paul often refers to our being in Christ. Baptism is a, pictures the fact that we're totally, totally identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. When Satan tempts us with guilt over the past sins, and believe me, he does that often. He reminds me of the horrible things I did and all the horrible people I've, I mean, the, horrible, the ways I, I hurt the people I love. Not the horrible people, but, you know, how horrible I was to the people I love. And he does. He brings me down. He says, wow, you don't deserve that person. You don't deserve to be, you know, part of this ministry. You don't deserve, you know, they deserve better. Those thoughts still, they do. They creep, still creep in my head. We have to take refuge in those times. You have to take refuge. I have to take refuge in the cri- in, in, in Christ's or Jesus' blood that he shed. All of God's promises, all of God's promises. And it says this in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. All of God's promises are yes in Christ. We're even seated with Christ in heavenly places. My friends, church, believer, Christian, focus on these truths by faith. Fixing our eyes on Jesus means trusting Him even when sinners wrong us. The author tells us to consider Him who has endured 
such hostility by sinners against himself. Consider, the word consider there used only here in the New Testament means calculate. Just as Jesus balanced the joy before him against the cross, so we must also consider the fact that the more committed we are to Jesus, the more those who oppose him will oppose us. The more you fall in love with Jesus, the more you're committed to him, the more you know him personally, the more others that are opposed to him will come against you too. No matter how nice you try to be, no matter how nice we can try to be, and how accommodating and how loving people are still going to oppose you because you're in love with Jesus. But we calculate We calculate that the joy of knowing Jesus, of knowing and obeying Jesus, is greater than all of the rejection, anger, ridicule, or anything worse that we might have to bear for his sake. Number four, fixing our eyes on Jesus is the key to not grow weary and lose heart. The literal rending is that you not fail through weakness, through weariness, fainting in your souls. Spiritual failure happens gradually. It happens gradually over time from continuous weakening. Just as a runner who isn't in excellent condition gradually slows down, And finally collapses. So the believer who does not keep looking with faith to Jesus will eventually collapse. Today, we call it burnout. And it seems that there are many who are weary in their souls in the Christian marathon. Is this describing you? Is, are you right now in that weary place? Are you tired? Are you, you know, be careful. Be strengthened. Come, just allow the Lord to, to come back to that place. Fall on your knees fall, and just ask him, Lord, I need you. I need your strength. I'm sorry for, for walking away, for maybe just looking away from the cross, for focusing on other things besides you. But I want to continue to run this race, and the only way I can do it is through your, with your help. Well, if you're weary in this Christian marathon, the remedy, the remedy is to fix your eyes on Jesus. So I, as I sum up this message here, if you're weary... In the race, maybe you need to cast off some hindrances that are, or some entangling sins. Someone has pointed out that gold is just as heavy as a weight of lead. If you're trying to carry the world's treasure while you're running the race of faith, you're going to get tired. So throw off whatever hinders your growth in godliness. Perhaps you're grumbling about the course that God has set before you. You look at others who are putting putting foreign armies to flight and receiving back their dead by resurrection. But you're wandering in the deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. You think, it's not fair. You need to submit to the sovereign hand of God who sets different courses for his children according to his purpose. And so perhaps this morning you need to refocus on Jesus and the joy of receiving the crown of righteousness that he has promised to those who finish the course. See, you can't run the race if you've never entered it. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you aren't even in the race. And if you don't enter the race and run with endurance, 
you won't get the prize. And if that's what you want, if that, you want that prize, then come to him. Come to him at the cross. Lay your sins before him and he will forgive you. No matter how bad you've blown it, no matter how bad you think your he will for, how bad your, you think your sin is, he will forgive you. And you will become born again. He will give you a new life. The Holy Spirit will come live in you, and he will show you a better way. He will open your eyes to just so many amazing and wonderful things. He will show you what sin truly is, but he will also show you what love really is, what love truly means, what sacrifice truly means. So if you want to start running this race, I want to invite you to the cross to ask Jesus to come and be your Lord and Savior. When you do that, that's when that gun goes off, that racing gun goes off. And that race will go on until the moment you breathe your last breath. And then you will see him come face to face with him, with him and he will tell you, welcome, my good and faithful servant. So if you want to do that, wherever you're at, if you're watching, listening, um, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. I'm going to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And pray this with all your heart, with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, let us know. If you're watching this and you prayed that, reach out to us. You want to hear how you came to hear this message and, and how you prayed that. We want to maybe help you in your next steps. In your Christian, we don't want to just leave you like that, and because this is again a, a race, this is a journey, and you have others that want to help you in this marathon. So reach out to us, and we will uh, maybe sh invite you, invite you here if you're here locally, but also wherever you're at, we can you know we have resources where we can help you find a, a good Bible teaching church. If you need a Bible, we can help you with that too. Um, but if you need prayer. You know, we can pray with you. So please reach out to us. Um, several ways you can do that. Again, on social media there, on our website. Um, but again, we want to hear from you. Thank you so much for those of you watching again for joining us, uh, for being with us. I hope that you have a great week. Um, be blessed and be the salt and light wherever you're at. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.